Hi there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, I hope you're all feeling safe as our province begins to reopen. This is our Vancouver. Coming up, a local restaurant shows off its new spring salads, perfect for your next picnic. And how wedding planners are preparing for a big rebound as COVID restrictions begin to be lifted. But first, peeling back the layers of BC's history. During that period of time in Canada, there was a lot of prejudice and discrimination. East Indian people were not allowed in certain places. Do you ever pass by a building and wonder just what stories it might hold? Well, that's one of the ideas behind the short film series, Behind the Facade, for the Knowledge Network. And our next guest found a heartbreaking story at the Gursik Temple in Abbotsford. Baljeet Sangra's film is have you forgotten me? Baljeet, hello there. Hello, hi Gloria. Thanks so much for joining us. And what can you tell us about this series, Behind the Facade? Um, it's, a, it's a series of 10 shorts commissioned by Knowledge Network, produced by Lantern Films. And it's a story of like exactly what you said, you know, what are the story behind uh, community spaces? Um, and often when you look behind a space, you hear stories of resilience, community, and um, yeah, there's 10 diverse shorts in the series and I'm really proud to be one of them. Yeah, it's a great concept for sure. So what about your film? It's called Have You Forgotten Me? What can you tell us about that? Um, yeah, it's, it's a short, but it's about the oldest Sikh temple. Uh, it's still standing in North America called the Gur Sikh Temple. And uh, it, it got designated historical status um, sometime in the early 2000s, I think. I remember going out there when John Chrétien was here, Sheila Cobbs, the whole community came out in bus loads and it got that designation. And that was actually the very first time I saw that temple. And I was kind of blown away with its frontier architecture. It just looked right out of a Western movie because there's actually a new uh, temple across the street. Anyway, so I went to that place. So when I got asked by uh, the producers of uh, the series, if I'd like to direct a short, I was thrilled and I got to go there and dig into the archives, meet elders of the community, hear their stories. And one of those stories really stood out and it was about a story of, um, of uh, a pioneer family that were separated for 20 years. And uh, the wife wrote letters to her husband and one of the lines that really stood out was, have you forgotten me? And my entire youth has been waiting for you. So that really touched my heart. And we did a story on that because it tells one story, but it, in a way it tells everybody's story. Interesting, yes, but your, your story about this particular family, it doesn't end where your film ends, does it? What, what happens when, when their son comes to live in Canada? Oh, um, so, so uh, yeah, this story, uh, a pioneer came in the 1930, uh, Mr. Gill separated for his wife again, like for like 20 years. He goes back to India, brings his wife and new son to India and they assimilate. And, you know, uh, it's just sort of like a real pioneer story. The, the, he, Mr. Gill didn't, you know, had no education, but he worked really hard, started a business, brought his family. It's a story of resilience and community through one family. And um, yeah, so we got to show some of their archives and their story. And um, the, the elder who's has since passed on, Mr. Gill, um, we hear his story through his son and daughter-in-law and the letters that were written between the parents. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting to look back for sure. But um, what would you say this temple means for the community today? Well, um, it's like a touchstone that, you know, our story, our, uh, our, our story here in Canada, you know, as a settler community, you walk through the halls, you, you imagine all that took place in the community spaces, you know, right to vote, uh, the Komagata Maru, you know, organizing around that, all of that sort of stuff. So um, it's just about, yeah, resilience, our struggle, our community, um, and I think sometimes you just don't really appreciate something when it's in your backyard. And when I went there and I looked at the guest book and I saw all these entries from around the world and they're all thanking, you know, the community for keeping this because it just, 
you know, we need to tell our story and pass it on to the next generation. And it's a rich history to share. Yeah, it sure is. And I mean, for you as the filmmaker then, Balji, what, what was the, the highlight for you throughout this process? Um, again, being able to meet some of the elders, there's a couple shots near the end of the film where we, we um, you know, we had them come and, there, and we had uh, pictures of their archives blown up and they were showing us who they were. And these pictures are dated like 1920. And they're like, oh, that's me. And it's a little boy in the corner. It's just so heart, uh, just touched my heart. But also I have a personal connection. I'm, I'm a granddaughter of a pioneering family. So I imagined you know, my grandfather being in this place. And I knew, you know, my grandfather knew some of these families. So it just really made me feel like what, uh, what my grandparents' experience must have been when they came. So it was a personal story as well for me. It touched me and made me think of my own history. Well, nice to talk to you. Thanks so much for telling us about your film, Have You Forgotten Me? Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Hey, this is Danny, and you're watching our Vancouver. Wall lizards. They may seem, yeah, small and cute, but a population boom is posing a real problem for fruits and vegetables in BC. Because they were initially introduced to Vancouver Island in the late 60s, but now they appear to be on the move. Wall lizards, the adults generally have some green color to them and the scales on the back are really tiny, about the diameter of a sewing pin. Hi, I'm Gavin Hankey at the Royal BC Museum, and here on Vancouver Island, we have a serious lizard problem. The first wall lizards, only a few were released here in 1967 in uh, Saanich, just south of Brentwood Bay. And then uh, in 1970, another 12 or so were released in the same area. And the problem we have now just stemmed from those few lizards that were released. They were originally in a private zoo, and when the zoo closed down, uh, the lizards were just let loose, free willy basically, just off they go and left to their own devices. And uh, this environment is perfect for them, so they obviously prospered. A guess is between 500,000 and 700,000 on Vancouver Island, Denman Island. There's a new population, hopefully, well, hopefully not a population on Salt Spring and Pender Island. And we've also now got them on the mainland. If we said 500,000 lizards, each eating one or two insects a day, that's a huge impact on the biodiversity of insects, spiders, pollinators. We, we really haven't got a grip yet on their impact on our pollinators, and that's one thing I'm really worried about. Do you like strawberries? If you like tomatoes, if you like any fruit and vegetable, blueberries, raspberries, they're all pollinated. So if pollinators are, just, are, are wiped out from a lizard invasion, then that would have a serious cascade effect on our food production. Native species are being wiped out by just simple lizard predation by an animal that shouldn't have been here in the first place. So that's, that's the real crime, is that something that was so avoidable in, in the sense of not letting a lizard loose uh, is now having a serious impact. And, and we're all gonna have to live with the after effects. All right, it's time for one of our favorite features of the program. This is when we get to showcase some of the photographs that have been sent in by you, our audience. So thank you. We'll start with this one. Warren Lowe caught this hummingbird in flight at Green Lake. Just an amazing shot. And we love our hummingbirds here on the West Coast. Yasuko Todd snapped this bright full moon in Kamloops. Just brilliant, Yasuko. Thank you. And finally, this absolutely adorable squirrel comes to us, courtesy of Layla Khalidi. Layla, thank you. Doesn't that just bring a smile to your face? Such a little cutie. And do send us more. Get out there with your camera and email your favorite photographs to us. Very easy. bcphotos at cbc.ca. bcphotos at cbc.ca. Well, friends, family, and political leaders are mourning the loss of a BC Indigenous advocate, Sarah Robinson. She spent her life raising awareness about Canada's colonial past and fighting for reconciliation. John Hernandez reports on her lasting impact. We're marching towards the future. She only had 35 years to do it, but Sarah Robinson spent her life making her home a better place. I personally believe that Canada can look better in the span of a generation. A renowned sense of optimism fueled by acknowledging the trauma of the past, 
Robinson was an advocate for Indigenous rights, her tool of choice, educating others about Canada's colonial history. Government employees who haven't had the opportunity to learn about these things uh, need to have opportunities so that they can understand the way that their job, their 9 to 5 every day, is in some way linked to Indigenous oppression. She embodied the strength and resiliency of an Indigenous matriarch. Chastity Davis Alphonse was her close friend for more than a decade. The pair met on a BC advisory council aimed at improving the lives of Indigenous women. She was just motivated and she could see it and taste it and feel the change in Canada for a better Canada, for better relationships. Robinson would go on to help re-establish BC's Human Rights Commission. She then enrolled in UVic's law program. Bright plans for the future that were suddenly cut short. And she just had a stomach ache and she went to the emergency room and an hour and a half later she was in an operating room getting uh, operated on. Robinson battled cancer for the last two years but still continued to educate and advocate right up until the day she died. She, you know, was looking forward to being reunited um, with her dad and with her ancestors. An online fundraiser in her name has since earned more than $100,000. Friends and family hope to launch a scholarship to honor her legacy. Anyone that has ever met her talks about her as a future leader. She, I really feel like she was one of the most formidable Indigenous woman leaders that our country has seen ever. A feat accomplished in just a few decades. Her loved ones wonder what she could have achieved with more. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. CBC Arts has been featuring short poems from poets across Canada. In this illustrated video, a member of BC's Kwantlen First Nation focuses on those who collect what others discard. My name is Joseph A. Dandran, and this poem is called Violins. As the city sleeps, there are those who go up and down the alley, picking up whatever may be laying on the ground that they toss into carts and all you hear are the squeaking wheels as each cart is pushed and pushed until it stops to pick up a pop can or a beer can to toss into their pile of gold. They are usually half the man they used to be. Some are drunks and others addicts, but they collect as if collecting for their choice of church. God welcomes them all, though some gave up on God long ago. Coming up, bleak odds from the World Meteorological Organization. It says there's a 40% chance the Earth will exceed the temperature threshold set by the Paris Agreement within the next five years. Johanna Wagstaff will join us to explain. that Earth is heating up. But according to a new release from the World Meteorological Organization, we could push past limits set by the 2015 Paris Climate Accord a lot faster than we thought. Every year, the WMO releases these new projections for what the decades ahead will look like based on new data and tighter modeling. And the forecast is looking dire. There's a 40% chance Earth will be hotter than the Paris target of keeping warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius within five years. That's up from the 20% chance last year. And there's a 90% chance that the world will set yet another record for hottest year by the end of 2025. Just a reminder of what those targets are set in the 2015 Paris Climate Conference. Two records, actually, or two goals. One, to stay below two degrees of warming since pre-industrial times, with the more stringent goal of keeping it below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Basically, island nations and developing countries saw that two-degree goal and said we need to aim for 1.5. We're already seeing the worst of climate change. And keep in mind, the world has already warmed over one degree Celsius. And for Canada, the forecast could be even more dire. Canada's warming at roughly twice the global rate, part of us being a large, you know, northern country. And, and so that means, you know, around one and a half degrees of warming globally actually means three degrees of warming here in Canada 
and in, in fact, even more warming in winter. Um, on average. And so, you know, if we stay on the current climate trajectory, I mean, we're really, Canada's going to be a very unrecognizable place. Hitting that threshold is very likely over the years to come, but it doesn't necessarily mean it will be our new average. Variability year to year means we might hit it, but it won't be until the 2040s that it actually becomes Earth's new average, which means there's still time to adapt and prevent the worst. And now you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet and I'll try to get it answered. Johanna, thanks very much. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, we have been getting some warm, sunny weather this spring already, and it brings to mind picnics. And when you think about packing up a picnic, you may think of snacks, sandwiches, something easy to tote, but our next guest wants you to consider some delicious salads. That's right, Stuart Boyles is the culinary director at Field and Social. Stuart, hello there. Hi, Glory, how are you? Thank you very much for having me on today. Well, thank you, and what a beautiful patio setup you've got there. You know, before we jump into picnics and, and uh, eating out or, or going to parks and that type of thing, we just had word uh, restaurants are able to offer some dine-in service again. What does that mean at, at your locations? Yeah, we're very excited to have people back in the restaurants. Um, you know, we're a, we're a grab-and-go restaurant where you can take your salad up this time of year. A lot of people like to eat in the park and outside, but we do have some very nice seating. Uh, we still have limited seating um, based on our spaces, but uh, people are more than welcome. You know, we, we have people spread out. We don't, we don't have barriers and stuff, so it's still very comfortable in the restaurants. And uh, it's a really nice feel, especially for the staff to see people inside. Uh, hearing the hustle and bustle and seeing people enjoying the salad. So we're, we're super thrilled. But yeah, by all means, come into all of our, uh, one of our stores is, uh, is, is, is kind of more of a, a grab and go counter, but the other three stores would be love to welcome you back in. Okay. I'd love to get a closer look at what you've got there in front of you. Uh, what are you going to show us how to make when we're talking about your special salads? Yeah, so I've got a very uh, a simple dish, which I want to do for you today. It's a new salad that we're going to start, uh, start this week uh, we've teamed up with a company called Berry Mobile which is uh, they for 21 years they've been working with local farms to uh, get the local produce that's farmed here in BC uh, out in Abbotsford and Richmond and get it uh, get it into the hands of places like Whole Foods uh, uh, other retailers like that and a few select uh, restaurants um, so we're really excited they're in East Vancouver here so we'll be picking up fresh strawberries from them every day bringing them to the store and then serving the salad until it's gone so I'd love to produce that for you. It's very, very simple. Uh, the idea behind this salad was really like, there's nowhere in the city where you can just go and get a bowl of strawberries. You know, you can get some strawberries with dessert. Uh, you can get a strawberry made out of some ice cream, but a bowl of strawberries where everything in the salad really lends itself to just supporting the flavor of the strawberries themselves. So the thing I like to serve with strawberries is spinach. So I have some spinach, kale, and a bit of romaine lettuce here for texture. <clears throat> Feta cheese, like a light, uh, you know, even uh, queso fresco or, or any kind of uh, any kind of light fresh cheese would go very well with this. So I really think almonds go great with the strawberries as well. So just some in there and to go with the flavors, uh, more for texture. So when you're eating your fresh strawberries, you have a little bit of crunch. And then a very nice, we, we use our aged balsamic vinegar with some olive oil. Uh, and honey, so to balance that out, so it's a really uh, honey balsamic, but really the key thing is an aged balsamic that has some sweetness to it, and that goes really well with the strawberries as well. So you can see just a good coating of that, and we're going to garnish with some fresh basil, and this is like, this is the simplest salad we have on the menu. The key thing is, is we're serving a big portion of strawberries on top of this, and everything that's in the bowl is just there to be enjoyed with the strawberries. And it couldn't be a better time of year. We have a little heat wave here in Vancouver. And uh, um, you know, we hope to be serving this until the strawberries are not available any longer. And oh. so that's it, very, very simple. Beautiful. It's got some crunch in there. Mm -hmm. It's got a, a big portion of like 100 grams of strawberries just, just so you can really get a chance to enjoy the strawberries as the main component of the dish. Very simple salad and then some fresh basil. This is from my own garden here. And that complements the, the balsamic. So you got some fresh cheese, you got some crispy almonds, nice spinach and uh, the strawberries, which are growing locally. And they were literally picked about an hour before 
I think they they came out there oh. picked two hours before we got them. So we got some here. That's from Barry Mobile in East Vancouver here. Wonderful. Uh, okay, well that website. looks like that looks like summer in a bowl to me. That is summer in a bowl. There's nothing better than biting into a a sweet, beautiful, juicy strawberry. But I, I love the idea of having it as a main and with a little bit of light cheese in there as well. So take us through what else you've got there on the table. It looks amazing. Yeah. So the, the, thank you. Yeah, these are three new salads that we did uh, just in the last few weeks, uh, really for our summer. The first one is is uh, this is the the uh, bacon and egg miso bowl. I call it. I partnered with One Arrow Bacon, uh, uh, someone I've known for a long time, uh, as a little private producer who, who makes his own bacon, sells into some local shops in the city. Um, so basically, he does a smoked uh, pepper bacon. Uh, we cut it in, in very large pieces and roast it, so it's just a little crispy on the outside, but still has some texture, like a little bit of kind of a, a bit of a, a lard on our porchetta kind of flavor. And then we have a, a miso tahini. Uh, dressing, which is very nice, new mommy flavor that goes well. We have some orzo pasta, so you got that little bit of pasta, the um, uh, roasted yams, which are also a nice flavor, a little bit of sweetness works well, and then a ramen egg on that. So just very, very simple, but lots and lots of flavor and a good portion of bacon on top. The other one we have is this is our um, roasted corn and white bean salad. So right now we're still getting corn that's kind of brought to us from from down south but we're very soon going to be having the local corn and that's going to be a thing we actually get the corn on the cob we roast it cut it off the cob and then mix it in the salad uh, with some white beans uh, roasted cauliflower which has a bit of chili the dressing's fantastic we're going to be selling these dressings soon through uh through a third party uh this is uh, our um roasted tomato our charred roasted tomatoes and jalapeno dressing so lots and lots of fresh tomatoes jalapenos roasted really heavy bit of vinegar very nice flavor to complement this. This is a vegan salad. Uh, and then a little uh, tostada, which we actually, we, we get the corn tortillas and we, we, we fry those in our ovens. So they're very light fried. And a whole half an avocado, a bit of uh, tomato in there goes really well. And then the other one we have this, uh, this is our, um, this is our farro and herb roast chicken. So really farro is a nice grain that we cook. Goes really nice texture, goes with cucumbers, tomatoes, a green herb dressing, and then some pita chips on top. So these are three of our summer salads, which we have, and we'll be offering these in our picnic uh, packages, which we'll be offering. So people people like to think that, you know, salads can be messy. They want to take, you know, picnic, they want to take ribs or, or sandwiches. But these these are the actual vessels that we serve them in. They're all nice and tidy. They have a little lid that goes on. We've got fantastic bags. People can stack them, order them with some of our signature house beverages and uh, we do a few uh, tasty treats inside so we're gonna be doing a package where you get a couple couple sweets a couple drinks and a couple salads and uh, you can take it straight up you can pre-order it have it ready for whatever time you want take it to the beach <laughs> a full meal picnic in a bowl Stuart wow great flavors great combinations you've really um, covered the basis for us today thank you very much and have a great summer I think we're set now thank you you as well thank you so much Hi, I'm Armin, watching our Vancouver. I'm here with my bear, Grout. He's very, very huggable. I hope you have your stuffies and your teddy bears with you because we're going to be doing four hugs a day. That's the minimum, four hugs a day, not the maximum. A lot of annual events have gone online during the pandemic. Festival Coquitlam's virtual teddy bear picnic concerts is one of them. This year's lineup of children's entertainers includes singer Charlotte Diamond, ventriloquist Kelly Haynes, and Haida storyteller Kung Jade, and Bollywood dancer Karima Essa. For more information, go to festivalcoquitlam.ca. The Talking Stick Festival seasonal celebration continues online with Summer Sojourn. It's a month-long celebration of Indigenous performance, art, and culture. The featured performers include dance artists Christine Friday, Maura Garcia, and Rebecca Sadowski, and Tara Williamson with her band The Good Liars. For more information, go to fullcircle.ca. 
Hey, Grant Lawrence here with another important update on CBC Music's Toyota Searchlight 2021. That's our hunt for Canada's best undiscovered musical talent. Now, we just announced the highly coveted top 100 artists of this year's contest. So that means we've whittled the list down from thousands of songs to just 100. I'll let you know how we arrived at this list in a moment, but first, check out a few of the highlights for yourself from CBC Music's Toyota Searchlight 2021 Top 100. Come and move with me It could be like on the movie screens I know this is the last damn FOMO Two weeks and I'm alone Thinking about a weekend trip to Arizona One night sip iced tea in a coma But I don't want to feel like I need to be with somebody else To feel okay I've been hard on myself and I don't want love from somebody who doesn't know me. I just want to see my friends. So there you go. There's a sampling of some of the original songs by Searchlight's top 100 Canadian artists. That last song with the very 2021 title, I Just Want to See My Friends. So how do we arrive at our top 100? Well, 50 artists were chosen by music industry experts and the other 50 were decided by your votes. And now the voting continues as we try to determine the elite top 10. Those will be announced on Tuesday, June 15th. You can discover and vote for your favorite Searchlight songs in our top 100 right now at cbc.ca slash searchlight. I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. Congratulations to that top 100 and good luck to all of them. I'll check in with you again next week. Coming up, after more than a year limited to small social groups, Many BC couples hope the end of the pandemic is going to mean that maybe next year they'll be able to tie the knot in a big way. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, as BC looks ahead to reopening, all types of local businesses that have been shattered by this pandemic are going to try to rebuild. But for at least one industry, it may be easier than first thought. In fact, as Anita Bath tells us, the demand for wedding vendors in 2022 is already through the roof. Traditionally, most weddings happen on the weekend, but next year, brides and grooms may not have much choice. Uh, we're definitely going to see weddings all through like Monday to Thursday. An industry that's been hit hard by the pandemic suddenly realizing a bounce back is in the works for 2022. Photographer Donald Risky says demand is skyrocketing. A lot of uh, double and even uh, some cases triple booked uh, weekends. But there are no complaints here. I hope we can keep up. We'll try our very best. Instead, the influx in inquiries is a welcome change for Sonny's bridal. We'll definitely need that to make up for almost a year and a half of lost business. A typical bride for an Indian wedding pre-pandemic would get up to four outfits. Now, if there's a wedding at all... 
maximum, usually just one, their main one. The loss has been devastating for Sunny's, but the Surrey store has managed to hold on. Not so for all wedding vendors. For some, this pandemic has meant hitting rock bottom and closing up shop altogether. The re recovery for them is grim because you have to restart. Um, you know, if, if it's a business that relies on inventory, you would have to amass that inventory again. Um, just the reputational loss of being out of business can be really difficult for, for businesses to return. For businesses that manage to keep going despite the losses. There's really um, a lot of opportunity now. Um, as long as you can get the staff and an inventory or whatever you need uh, lined up, the, the market opportunities are going to be there for, for these businesses. Opportunities that come as the tiny wedding trend perhaps fizzles away and becomes a distant memory. I can see the appeal of having very intimate weddings and I kind of personally like it as well, but given our community, I don't know how long that will last or how long people can kind of keep things toned down. For some communities, pre-pandemic weddings meant week-long gatherings with hundreds of family and friends. Not only do local vendors think the return of that is imminent, but they're also pretty sure that 2022 will bring some of the most over-the-top parties BC has ever seen. I need a bath, CBC News, Surrey. Now, indoor faith-based gatherings have returned across the province, but how it looks is a little bit different depending on where you go. Zara Premji has more on the changes you can expect and the COVID-inspired adaptions that may just stick around. <laughs> Praying in Congregation. It's a concept that may seem almost foreign or forgotten at this point in the pandemic. We believe in Sangat. Sangat means people sit all together in the presence of Guru Granth Sahib. And with the green light from Dr. Bonnie Henry, that sitting together can happen again. For the seniors, I think this is the big gift. And it's back after several months. We are very excited. All the people who hear this message, they are all excited. And now your hand sanitizer. That's great. Once again, warm welcome back to Jamaat Khanna. We are so happy to see you all again. You can proceed inside. Amazing. Thank you. Obviously, lots and lots of excitement and then also a bit of nervousness because we haven't really been together in a really long time. Of course, it's not the first time faith-based communities are reopening in the midst of the pandemic. We already have all the, uh, you know, uh, precautions. We already, uh, in, in last March, it's the same thing. We already did this. While Dr. Henry has okayed religious gatherings of up to 50 people in person, some are choosing to tread more cautiously. Just as the province has a slow opening, reopening, that's what we look at doing as well. But with physical doors reopening, it doesn't mean virtual ones will shut. Leaders and religious community members saying COVID brought an unexpected gift, a lesson on connecting in a virtual sense. People will be able to continue their access to, to the synagogue in, in multiple ways. For us, having those multiple doors of entrance, whether if it's physical or virtual, is extremely important. So there were many different forms um, that many different events that became virtual. Um, as we reopen, I think there is a large part of the community that's now become quite accustomed to some of those virtual offerings. So some of that will continue. Lessons learned from COVID that won't go away. Zara Ramji, CBC News, Vancouver. Now many people are feeling hope for the first time in more than a year now that BC has an ambitious restart blueprint. But for some, the idea of stepping out of social isolation and back into normal life can stir up some anxiety. Our Tanya Fletcher has that story. <laughs> yeah, like, of course, I'm really excited when everything reopens again. Chatting with this group of international students studying in Vancouver, they're ready to embrace the news with open arms, quite literally. We, we missed uh, this uh, social contact, so it's okay for us. We are really happy to, to see this again. I'm really excited. I think like it's a big part in the, for every young uh, people. We need uh, social uh, contact, so yeah, it's, I can't wait for that. 
As BC begins moving toward its goal of lifting virtually every public health measure by September, the excitement is palpable. But for some, it's also mixed with apprehension. Maybe later on in the summer I'll be more comfortable, but I feel like right now it's just, it's exciting news, but baby steps, right? I think it'll be a really slow rollout for me. <laughs> A recent survey found 52% of Canadians feel anxious about return to normal after COVID. An underlying hesitation the Premier himself acknowledged. There are going to be a lot of people who are anxious. There are people who are concerned that we may go too fast. Experts say a seesaw of emotions is not unexpected and in fact it's normal to feel some apprehension. It's been 15, almost 16 months where we've been in this chronic stress mode where our autonomic nervous system is on. It's not like it's going to, you know, it's going to automatically, you're going to come out of this chronic stress. What's going to take, it's going to take baby steps to really uh, make your mind not take your take over you. Finally, for others, the idea of reintegrating back into a pre-pandemic society is simply a strange one. Even in grocery stores, you, you let a, a person pass by you or um, <laughs> kind of go well around them. So it, uh, I think it'll take a while to get used to going back to what it used to be like. And time is what it'll take, welcoming a future that in many ways will look more like the past. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up. Celebrating 50 years of ladies golf in Burnaby with one of the local club's most senior members. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, the Burnaby Mountain Ladies Golf Club recently celebrated 50 years of play and camaraderie. And one of its longest tenured members is Moira Colburn. As Liam Britton tells us, the game has meant more to her during the pandemic than perhaps ever before. In a difficult year, golf has kept Moira Colburn in the swing of things. Oh, I like it. I like using my driver when I connect and you hear that nice sound. I, I enjoy it and I get mad at myself when I can't get the putter working. Turned again. Yes, I'm still very competitive to myself. At 85, Coburn is one of the longest tenured members of the Burnley Mountain Ladies Golf Club. The club is celebrating 50 years this week and Coburn has been swinging, pitching, chipping and occasionally slicing oh. for 43 of them. And I just love it. it the, the women are lovely, it's lots of fun. Golf isn't Coburn's first athletic passion. She was a high-level field hockey player, coach and manager. She played for Canada's national team in international tournaments in 1959 and 1971. She's been inducted into the BC Sports Hall of Fame for her contributions to field hockey. But in 1973, she developed ulcerative colitis. She needed major surgery and had to quit playing at a high level. And so uh, the doctor said, get Moira d doing something, buy her golf clubs. And so my husband bought me golf clubs. And I was strong physically, so I really, you know, could hit the ball well. She joined the Burnaby Mountain Ladies Club God in 1978. That is good. But this year, it's been about more than being over or under par. Yeah, <laughs> mine do anyway. <laughs> it's been about beating isolation when so many social outlets have been curtailed due to the pandemic you got to chat while you're playing your 18 holes. So it's, you know, it's wonderful. You're, you're talking with people and that's what the ladies, that's what we found in our club here, that it was, uh, it was really difficult. And they were all excited when we finally could get back and we could do 18 holes of golf. Down there. Playing the game at 85 is no small feat, <laughs> but Coburn has no plans to slow down. She wants to play until she's 90 at least. I sure hope I can. I feel very, very good. I'm very lucky. And why not? For almost all her years, athletic success is just par for the course. Woohoo! I did it! Liam Britton, CBC News, Burnaby. The face of comedy in North America is changing slowly. More Asians are getting laughs for their jokes, not because they're the punchline. 
And now more comedians and creators are addressing stereotypes by sharing their own stories. Eli Glasner has more on that. Thank you for coming. I'll see you in hell. For years, comedy had a crutch. Asian accents were a source for easy and lazy laughs. My uncle in Beijing, he's a very corrupt. Even from a supposedly progressive comedian such as Rosie O'Donnell. That monkey's my mama! Who surprised culture writer Naveen Kumar during a stand-up show. She started her bit by saying, I'm sorry for any, if there are any Indians in the room. At which point she told a story about a doctor. She puts on this sort of broad Indian accent and, uh, you know, that's sort of what gets the room laughing. <laughs> Yo, go, 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 go! Even Asian comics have done it, such as Canadian Anto Chan, who regrets his earlier material relied on stereotypes. Because we knew that the audiences were usually um, uh, white audiences um, that were really excited to hear a powerful Asian voice um, joke about stuff that they already know the punchline of. But when Chan just telling the audience he was Chinese became the punchline, it was a wake-up call. And I felt like they were just laughing at me. And this moment changed my entire per perception of like what it was that I was doing on stage. I love when people walk up to you and just guess your race. Now Chan's comedy and the stand-up scene itself is evolving. This evolution into having diverse audiences and being able to share our like true stories, that's something that I really believe. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. BC has a long history of deep battle lines being drawn over forests and forestry. Today, the fight is over Ferry Creek. In 1989, it was the Carmana Valley. Ian Hanamansing brought us that story. The reason that we're here today... These loggers say they've come here to save their jobs, to send a message to the people of British Columbia that environmentalists are wrong in trying to block plans to log most of the Carmana Valley. We believe and we support that 500 or so hectares of acres should be preserved, but that we have to be able to log sensibly the remaining 7,000 hectares of, of wood that's in the Carmana. Carmana Valley on Vancouver Island is what's called an old growth forest, never logged before, with huge Sitka spruce trees, including one that's believed to be the tallest tree in Canada. Macmillan Blodell has plans to log this area, plans that include saving the giant trees. But some environmental groups want all logging banned in Carmana, and they say they're not alone. I also see the tidal wave of support we're getting in British Columbia and right across Canada. This is Canada's redwoods. It should not and will not be logged. That may not be an empty promise. In the past year, the environmental lobby has succeeded in getting logging banned on South Moresby Island and a one-year moratorium on logging in the Stein Valley. Loggers here say they're worried the environmentalists are threatening their jobs. They're trying for the whole works. They want it all. You know, what are we going to be left with? We need something to log ourselves. You know, we, that's our job. That's BC's job. Why do we have the environmental groups say they're not the problem, that forest preservation won't mean lost jobs. But it was clear today the loggers don't believe them. You people are convinced of one role in this life This is what only. we need is talking to You people to don't care about other. us or our jobs at all. So really we don't That's waste the time say. on you. These demonstrators admit the environmental groups have done a better job so far in capturing the attention of the public. But they say now it's time to fight back. Ian Hanneman saying CBC News, Victoria. This week, there has been an outpouring of reaction to the preliminary discovery of human remains at the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. Here are some images from various local events taken by CBC Vancouver staff photographer, Ben Nelms. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio One for On the Coast. Goodbye for now.